Growth is one of these weird things. Everyone wants to do growth. Everyone cares about growth. Every company needs to grow. But there's not a lot of kind of official like knowledge how to do this properly. And I know that I learned a lot on the go. So again, I'm going to teach you some of the principles. And I'm going to do this in kind of uh, questions. And some of these questions are going to sound honestly dumb. But bear with me. So let's start with this one. What should we grow? It's like a question that uh, I guess farmers are asking themselves before they, they sow. I'm asking because one, oh, I think we're, we have some leggers. Uh, I'm asking because there's a lot of metrics you can focus on. Uh, in fact, this is a problem with a lot of companies I see. They, they track and measure and there's so much data and some people tell them you need to focus on revenue and some people tell, tell them actually it's the customer lifetime value and sometimes it's minutes watch. It really, there's so much. How do you pick? And I think not picking is one of the, the cardinal sins. If you're kind of trying to grow too many things at the same time, maybe it's not such a good idea. So I'll give you three kind of tips or frames to think about this. One is choose something called the one metric that matters. And I gave you some examples from companies that pick the one metric of matter that matters and st stuck with it for years. And by picking this one, they actually managed to achieve tremendous growth. Now, first question is, why just one? Why not five? Why not two? Any ideas? Why one? Focus. Focus the team. That's a key thing. The one metric that matters means that everyone in the company knows what is the North Star. What is the thing we always are looking to improve? You don't need to be in the meeting with every engineer and every designer and every uh, marketeer to remind them we're actually working on improving nights booked, which is what uh, eBay decided to, to uh, focus on. It's, it's just a clear message, everyone understands this. And then when people come over and say, hey, you know what we need? A grand visual refresh of the entire product. Or we need to rewrite the code. Or we need to launch this feature. You can always ask them, yes, good idea, but how does that impact our one metric? And that's a really kind of important discussion to have about everything you do. If you focus on growth, you should ask yourself always, is this helping growth? Now, looking at these metrics, do you see anything that's common to all of them? They're pretty varied. It's like nights booked, minutes watched, gross merchandise volume. Does any, everyone know what gross merchandise volume is? In a, in a market, sorry? A unit of? It is a unit of measurement, but it, it's actually a number. It's a, in, in a marketplace like eBay, it's how much actually dollars are exchanging hands uh, between the sellers and the buyers. So what's common to all of this? Number. They're numbers? Very good. They're, they're not metrics, they're numbers. OK, yeah? I'd say stickiness. They're related to stickiness. What else? Well, I would say that all of these are about the users and about how much usage you're actually getting on your site. You don't see here anywhere like how much revenue are we making or how many ad impressions are we creating or what's the size of the unit of the, the cart, the average cart value. This is all about usage and how much users are actually using our product. And indirectly, it's actually about how much value we're giving to them. So if you're eBay and you're tracking nights booked, it actually, the more this number grows, the more it means that people are able to find Airbnb uh, places to, to crash into. And the more they, they come back and use it, the more it indicates that you're actually doing the right thing when it comes to the users. And that's true for monthly active users in Facebook and weekly active users in Gmail and all of these things. They're all kind of indicating that you're giving users to value to users. Um, 
I like very much uh, WhatsApp messages sent, but in Gmail we didn't actually decide to choose to, to track messages sent. We choose, chose to track weekly active users. And we didn't choose to do monthly like Facebook, but uh, weekly. The reason is this. When we looked at Gmail and asked ourselves what's actually the, the one metric that indicates that people are finding it useful and are using it on an ongoing basis, we realized people are using it in many different ways. Obviously, let's, let's put to the side for a second the uh, information workers. They're using it tremendously a lot all the time. It's their key product still. But for consumers, a lot of consumers actually don't come to Gmail in order to send messages. They do a lot of this over instant messaging. But they do come to Gmail to receive stuff. They, re they do want to receive their, their airline tickets, their confirmations, their uh, receipts, all this stuff just lands you in your inbox and you, and you like it there because it's a safe, clean, secure place to keep all your important things. So we didn't really find a way to track this form of activity plus some people are sending messages to themselves plus there's a lot of different forms of activity. So we decided to focus on just weekly active users. Just in case no one knows what's the difference between weekly and monthly, obviously one is about a week, the way you measure these things is you take a day, you look at the trailing seven days for weekly, and you count how many people were active during this time. And I will explain what active means in a second, because it's not uh, as straightforward as it might sound. Facebook is tracking monthly because monthly active users, mo most of the people who are monthly active are also one day active. It's shocking, but Facebook is such a sticky product that the difference is not that huge. But for Gmail, we have a lot, or oh, they have, a lot of uh, product, uh, accounts that are kind of, like people are using them just once a month or whatever, for whatever reason. So they're secondary accounts. So we decided to focus really on the, those accounts that are active. That on a weekly basis, people, at least once a week, they come and check the account and do something interactive with it. And that was our North Star. All right, so you need to choose this thing, and it's not as trivial as it seems. It's not revenue, it's not uh, the, the, the default thing you, you might think about when you talk with your investors, you need to find it. Then you need to realize that below it there's at least two other tiers of metrics. So you have your top tier metric, it's your North Star, but these things obviously decompose, it's like a tree, they're at the top, and then they decompose into sub metrics that actually are behind them. So if you really care about revenue, customer lifetime value, um, monthly reoccurring revenue, all these metrics are important to you. And you need to track them. They should be in your dashboard. But there's a problem with them. It's really hard, and also with the top level metrics. It's really hard to come to a product team and say, you know what, improve revenue. Or, or even improve nightly uh, uh, number of nights booked. It's just very hard for a product team to, to work on this. So for that, we have usually a third level, which is kind of your proxy metrics. And these are things that you realize, and realizing it the, is the hard part, that if you move them, these are your levers, these other things will also move. And at the end of the day, you will get growth in, in, uh, in whatever it is that you care. So let's take, for example, this thing, average of number of photos on a listing. This is from Airbnb as well. Very early on, Airbnb, they looked at their data and they realized that the listings that have the nice photos, the professionally shot photos or had photos at all, were converting much better. Because their North Star was number of nights booked, they really wanted to encourage this kind of behavior. So they, from a very early stage, they started sending people. Initially, it was the founders or the first 10 people in the company, and later on professional photographers. Two, two people were listing their uh, apartments or rooms in Airbnb and helping them create uh, professional looking uh, photos. And that drove tremendous growth. There's an article, they published a blog post about how this small change actually became a very important growth uh, driver for, um, for Airbnb. It's actually a source of revenue because the people are willing to pay also for the photographer. So decomposing your metrics and understanding there's the top tier, second tier, third tier is the second step. 
And then there's something called the growth model. Once you have your metrics, you kind of need to understand how they interact and how they actually impact your growth. So this is from Facebook. And Facebook are kind of the, the legends of, of growth. Obviously, they managed to grow more than anyone else. Uh, almost 2 billion active users now. So with respect to Facebook, the, they're the growth team, which was in itself kind of a new thing to have people working. And this growth team grew to uh, eventually to like 100 or more people, probably hundreds now. And they came up with some insight. What is actually going to cause um, a monthly active user growth in Facebook? And two of these insights are not very insightful, to be honest. The left one says, OK, there's a funnel. And we get people to the landing page, and we try to activate them, to, to, to convert them, and then to have them register to Facebook, give us their data. So our rate of growth is related to this. And they consider this tactical. This is clear, OK, marketing, whatever. Then on the right-hand side, another insight that is not very shocking. It's like, we will be able to keep these people active only if we give them tremendous value. So our core value, our product market fit, and actually the size of the, the market that we're addressing here is going to directly impact our uh, growth. If anyone doesn't know this, the most important part of growth always is this, your product value. If you have, I'll, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but if you don't have a product that is sticky, that is valuable to the user, that actually fits very well with their needs, you shouldn't be talking about growth. But then they came up with this thing in the middle where they could interject and do some magic, the growth team. And this is what they call the magic moment. What is the magic moment? Once you convert this user into an active user, first time they land off on Facebook, what is it that they really need to see in order to become a retained user? And they came up with this insight that if these guys uh, have seven friends within the first 10 days, they're more likely than not to, to stay. So it's about first and foremost seeing the faces of your friends there and then connecting with them on Facebook, be, uh, becoming friends. Now it seems maybe trivial, but when they did this, they didn't realize that this is the core. And, uh, and it makes total sense. If, if you come into Facebook, everyone is a stranger. You don't connect with that many people. You don't know anyone. Your feed is pretty empty. And also, you don't have people to share with, which are kind of the two most important features of uh, Facebook, right? You, you get the update from your friends, and you share with them. You create a kind of an audience. So they realize that the people that are kind of churning off are the ones that are not finding friends, and they really focused on, on helping this. And this, again, just like in the case of Airbnb, this was pivotal. This really made Facebook much more sticky and much more successful. All right, so uh, key metric to focus on, decomposing it into its subparts, and then coming up with some sort of model. When should you start working on growth? So uh, you may be familiar with this. This is a model called the S-line, uh, uh, the S-curve of uh, product life cycle. It basically says products start off like in this inception phase where you're just inventing them, they're just starting, it's an idea. Then they're catching on if they're successful, and you're moving into growth, then they're mature. It's much harder to grow them when they're mature because there's competition, it's, uh, the market is saturated, whatever. And then at some point they come to kind of start declining until they reach end of life. Lots of people like this model. It doesn't work for every product, by the way. And, um, for example, a lot of people expected this to happen to PCs because of tablets. Tablets will come in and kind of kill PCs. Didn't quite happen nicely according to the curve. So take it with a grain of salt. And basically, kind of the rule of thumb is you need to work on growth between these points, between your product market fit and the point where the product cannot be grown anymore. You should focus on that. Let me deep dive into this a little bit more. Whenever you do some sort of growth activity, you're probably trying to create one of these three patterns of growth. There's the hockey stick, which I'll talk a lot about. By the way, most of you are startupists. How many in a startup? Oh, actually, how many in a medium-sized company? Super. How many in a big company? All right. I thought I was talking just to startupists. 
this is completely relevant to you guys as well, by the way. Um, the difference is that this hockey stick stuff is very hard to do in a big company. This usually is the starting phase of a startup. But in big companies, and I know because I worked for one for a while, I, I, I also was on the left side. I was on startups. Most of the time, what you do is step functions or trajectory improvements. So what's a step function? Let's, you have some sort of growth. Let's say you're growing 5%, your revenue or your active users or whatever it is you care about grows 5% a year. You say, this year we want to grow 7%. Where do you get this 2% more? So one option is to take what you have and launch it to a new market, for example. So launching in another country might create a step function. You're creating <coughs> more, a, a, a bigger user base, but actually the trajectory will not change. Another option is to grow your inventory, if, if you're into that, to localize to a new language. All these things create step functions. And they're kind of predictable, usually if you do your work right, but there aren't that many of them. It's hard to find a lot of step functions. More commonly, you're doing trajectory changes. So you're coming up with, usually this is a product change, and saying from now on we will do, the, we launch this uh, feature and we hope this will make the product much more sticky or that much more sticky. So it's a lot of actually micro adjustments. So growth, initially, I, I told you growth gets easy, harder and harder as you grow. So initially it's, you do the, the hockey stick, but then you start doing these right side step functions and trajectory changes. But let's look a bit deeper into the hockey stick for a second just to understand the question of what, when should you start growing. And, and this is true also for a new product within an established company, by the way. So at the elbow of this thing, or the, the knee, is the product market fit. This is really the point where you realize you found a market, and you establish the need, or again, you can give them, and you build a product that actually fits this very well. And you know with some certainty that if you find 100 people from this, product, from this market, and you put the product in front of them, you make it, them aware of it, some decent percentage of them will like it, start using it, and retain. What is decent is a matter of interpretation, and it also depends on your vertical, but you're there. This is a very, very uh, enviable position. Most startups don't reach this, or, or don't know that they didn't reach it. It's very tough. In order to find this, you need to do some sort of discovery phase. And this discovery phase is all about finding the market and the product and getting to this product market fit. You iterate on something called your value hypothesis. You develop customers, you go and talk with them. You build MVPs, you do pivots, you do all of this stuff uh, in order to gain, to learn, essentially, and to gradually build this product. Once you do reach product market fit, that's the time to change gears. Why is it changing gears? Because here, in the discovery phase, you don't really want to grow. You don't want to, to experiment on 50,000 customers. You want just a handful. You do things that don't scale. But here, in growth, that's exactly when you want to, to move to this other level. This is where you start building your growth hypothesis, which we'll talk about in a second, your growth engine. You develop your channels. You hire a sales team, you do marketing, you optimize for cost of acquisition, you do all of this stuff at this pace. And then you scale and you optimize. You scale the team and you start doing optimization on the product that you already have. Left side, right side, very different. It's very important to start growth in the right phase. In fact, there was research about this, that most startups that die, or the most damaging thing the startup can do is trying to grow too early, before they actually hit this product market fit. And every marketer will tell you the same. Like, if you try to do marketing for a product that doesn't stick, you're actually pushing into a, a, a leaky bucket. And it does horrendous things if you have a sales team too early. And they are sales, they want to sell. Uh, so they're pushing you into customers' hands and they're doing all sorts of pilots and whatever and the product is not ready. You don't even know who are the right product uh, customers. So, so there was this research called um, the Genome Project. They talked to, or, or they actually analyzed uh, more than 3,000 startups and what caused them to die or to succeed. And they figure out that this moving to growth too early is actually the biggest sin. All right, so 
we know a couple of things about growth. Just questions so far? There'll be time for Q&A, but feel free to interject. Yes? How do you practically find the magic moment? How do you practically find the magic moment? Uh, it's a combination of uh, user research, like qualitative user research, and data analysis, as always. You, you look at the data and you kind of try to understand, or you try to find a correlation. You say the people that stick do this type of actions. And then you ask yourself, what, why is it actually these actions? And then almost always there's a problem of, of causation and correlation. So let's say in Gmail we found that people that uh, send messages are, tend to stick. But is it that they stuck, uh, stuck in Gmail because they, they sent the first message? Or is it because Gmail is generally valuable to them they stick around and then they start sending messages. That's just an outcome of the fact that something else. So this is a very tough problem. I'm working on a lot of this with my clients. This is one of the things we're trying to distill. Like looking at all your data, what is it that you can put in front of a user on day one and get them to really get excited and, and understand the value that you're giving them. I'm gonna talk about this a bit, a bit more. All right. So let's go back to this hockey stick, which, which again, it's startups, but also new launches within products. And I have to tell you, most launches in Google, outside of Google, in every company, in every startup, don't go like this. They just go flatline, and they're very disappointing. And afterwards, you can do a lot of uh, what's called success theater. You can kind of hide this inside a big company, by the way, it's easier. You can come up with a different metric, say, ah, oh, it didn't really, grow the way we expected this, but we learned a lot, or we did something, uh, or it improved something, user satisfaction. That's not what you want to do. You want to do this. And companies that do this successfully, it's just mind-blowing how fast it, it happens. It's just exponential growth. Instagram just appeared, and overnight they had tens of thousands of users, and then the next month probably had hundreds of thousands, and it just like pff, exploded. Facebook, even Gmail at the time. So something here is at hand that is more than just minor optimizations, uh, etc. Uh, and it's not just like turning on a switch and all of a sudden it explodes. So the key is in the curve. As you can see, it's kind of exponential. Usually when you have exponential things, it means that you have some sort of positive feedback loop or uh, virtuous cycle, if you like, which means something that the more you do it, the more you get the positive re uh, response you want. So I'm going to show you three, actually. Let's first look at this. And you know this, this is kind of the normal journey of the user through your, um, the early stages from a non-user to active. There's some sort of acquisition funnel. You, usually you put advertising or you do some social media campaign, influencers, whatever it is. Or if you have a product, you cross sell. And you bring them into the state where they can activate themselves. So to the sign-up page or to the first step of uh, registration, whatever it is. And then they go through this activation funnel. Some drop, but some complete. And then you have an activated user, which is different from an active user. An active user is then someone who goes into your site and does something active. Uh, and, and I'm stressing this because I'm seeing people count visitors as active users. A visitor is not necessarily active. They just landed on your page, and if they live right away, they're just contaminating your active user data. In Gmail, for example, we don't count people who install Gmail. We don't count people who set up an account in Gmail as active. We don't count people who just open the, the app, or, or they don't count uh, the app and look at it. We don't count, or they don't count people that just land on the gmail.com page and, and just stare at it. All of these are not active users. They need to take one of several interactive actions for Gmail to count them as active. And when you track seven day actives, you're actually counting these people. All right, so number one. Okay, going back. So these active users, they can do three things, three mir miraculous things that will help your growth. And these are coincidentally the three growth engines 
uh, that uh, you need to optimize for. So number one is retention. These people can come back and use your product again on a different day. And that's awesome because it really means something. Using a product once, everyone can pull this off by doing the right marketing. Using a product twice or three times on, a, on an ongoing basis, that's actually the magic. That actually shows that they're finding value in what you're doing. So retention, I will talk a lot about it in a second. Referrals. So active users that like your product will find ways to actually cause other people to come into your activation funnel. Very true for consumers. This is all about viral infection and viral growth, but also true for software as a service, for, uh, for, for uh, business to business, uh, B2B sort of things. You can find ways to leverage your active users, your successful installs, to push more people inside. Word of mouth is very important. The, the referrals you can show in your, or the testimonials you can show on your website. These things are very important for businesses. The third one is revenue. So ideally at some point you will start monetizing these active users by selling them something, a subscription, in-product in purchases, whatever it is. And then you can keep the money in your pocket and be happy, or you can take and funnel some of this money to acquire more users. And as long as the lifetime value of this customer is significantly larger than the cost of acquisition, you just created a growth engine because you can grow infinitely, theoretically, because you can always push some of the money to acquire the new user because you know that you will make much more money off that user. That's why customer lifetime value is so important. So three engines of growth, three virtuous loops, feedback loops. And the more you get active users, the more you get retained users. And I'll show you in a second why retained users are growing. The more they use the product, the more you get ret uh, retention. The more you get active users, the more referrals. And then you get more active users who can refer yet again. It's important as long as the uh, kind of the viral coefficient or the, is greater than one. If each user that comes and becomes active brings more than one in a, 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 another active user, you're in a good shape because you will grow through referrals as well. And of course, the more active users, the more revenue you'll get, the more. So what is the one thing that will actually cause all these three loops to turn much quicker, to turn faster and faster and to drive more and more people through these loops? One thing. Tip, it was already, it appeared before in one of the slides. Is it way of people? Sorry. Product value. Product value, thank you very much. Remember when Facebook came before and said, oh, you have magical moments and you have acquisition, you have all this. Product value is the number one most important thing because it pumps this virtual loop so much faster. If you get a valuable product, your growth life is so much easier just because this is the mechanic. Now I'm going to give you a bonus, a fourth uh, virtual loop, which very few companies actually utilize successfully. As you do all of this stuff and you acquire people and activate them and, um, and, and cause the retention, you, you accumulate data. And you get to talk to these people and you get all sorts of feedback from them and you read what they think. And if you do your job right, you are learning stuff. You're learning a lot about these people, you're learning about their lives, you're learning how to, how to optimize acquisition and activation, etc. And you're using both your data and your qualitative insights to make all these things even more efficient. So data is the fourth growth engine. And companies like Google, like eBay, like Booking.com, like all these companies that are very data-driven have a tremendous value because they have a lot of data and they can use it in many different ways to learn. But even as a startup or a fledgling product within um, a bigger company, you should start thinking how to use, to accumulate your data and to put it to use for this particular purpose. Awesome. Uh, just to mention, if you're interested, uh, the, when you start selling to people stuff, all of this was kind of the, the free active user you're actually looking to make them from non-customer to customer and you have yet another funnel in the middle which is the conversion funnel. 
But apart from that, it's the same. The same principle, same growth engines, everything. Whatever, I, everything I told you here has a name. It's called Pirate Metrics, although this visualization is not part, usually part of it. And Pirate Metrics, do you know why they're called pi Pirate, by the way? Who knows? Yes? All right, if you pronounce the, the acronym of the five, uh, it sounds like R. So, Pirate Metrics. So these are the ones I mentioned. Notice that they're all about ratios, and they're all about kind of, uh, or rates. It's like percentages. It's not absolute numbers, and that's very important because it's harder to fake percentages. When you do rates and ratios, you're actually in, in a better shape. All right, you can find this online. Let's go to the most important one, retention. I talked about it before. Retention curves tend to look like this. What you do, you, you come at week one and you accumulate a cohort, let's say a thousand people. Then you wait a week and then at, at the end of week two you ask yourself how many of these thousand people, the, that particular cohort, are still active or, or are paying customers. You can do this also for paying customers. So the first week is customers that purchase something and then you ask yourself how many of them purchase on week two. This is kind of uh, uh, e-commerce retention. But let's go with active users. And then you go on week three, week four, etc., and you start plotting all these points and you get your retention curve. As long as this eventually levels off, obviously you lost your 90% of your people. That's, and that's normal. As long as it levels off and it stays kind of parallel to, to the x-axis, you have growth. You can grow this thing. And why is that? Because this is the first cohort I showed you. This is the cohort the week after, and so on. Each one of these cohorts leaves you this little residue of people, 5%, 10%, 15%, and they accumulate. So disregard all this sharp stuff at the left side. These are just the week one. You don't care about this. What you care is what's left over. And if something is left over, you accumulate all these people, you have growth. If you plot this, this is... Week one, week two, week two, it, it kind of goes on a, in this case, on a linear curve. But uh, So retention is the basis of your growth. With no retention, there's no growth. So here, these are all synthetic numbers, by the way. I, I, I just did this with a spreadsheet. Uh, so here we have retention curve that is actually very, very solid, 50% retention. Only the trick is it's 50% every week. So from week one, I had 1,000 users. On week two, I had 500. On week two, I had 250. And what you can see here is if retention stays fixed, you crash into zero. In most cases, actually, you crash into zero much earlier than this because uh, it's not 50%. It's 10%, then 10% of 10%. Then it's too small to measure, and then you have zero. So this is not a good retention curve. But luckily, retention doesn't work this way. Retention, if you look at the percentages in the second row, they improve week, uh, from visit to visit. So uh, here I did week over week, but from visit to visit, people tend to retain better. Let me give you an example from uh, e-commerce. So you sell to a person, then there's, if I'm not mistaken, 37% on average on e-commerce side that they will make a second purchase. But then those people who made the second purchase there's a 50-something percent chance that they will make a third one. And then it gets higher and higher until you get to this point where they're very loyal to you and they just keep buying on a regular basis. So for e-commerce sites, just getting through this hurdle from one purchase to two is a huge advantage because the two are much more sticky than the three, etc. So that's why the retention curves look like this and doesn't converge to zero because eventually it converges to... Uh, this is 100% retention week over week, as you can see. So very important to track retention. Yes? Yeah, I want to ask you, um, how, how does it work when a product has a very high level of um, a I mean, for example, I was thinking in Kuala so imagine I don't think of it every year, every, every year. So maybe I can use the app two weeks very intensively and mm -hmm. stop using it. Or maybe I can register only just in case, so 
we will not that type of product that are supposed to be used on a daily basis. How to measure the retention? On a daily basis, or it's one time and then you never use it again? No, maybe you use it, but you have very wide periods between one and the other, but not because you are not a not return customer, but because the product does, is not mean to be built for business frequently. Absolutely. So the question was, what happens with uh, sites, for example, is e-commerce or uh, some of these marketplaces, where they're not supposed to be used on a weekly basis? So it, what do you do here? So obviously, you don't plot on a weekly basis. You look on a much larger scale. Uh, these sites tend to think in customer lifetime value. A lifetime is a big thing. They usually ask themselves, how much is this user buying on the first month? on the first 90 days and the first year and then on the lifetime of the user. The 30 days is very important because if you can get, user, users usually make most of the purchases in the first 30 days in an e-commerce site. And if you, do, you don't get them to do the second purchase on the first 30 days, you lost them usually. So, so it's, it's basically the same, but it's on a much larger scale. It's, uh, it's stretching it and it's not expecting that these users will retain all the time, but it's expecting that when they do have this urge, they need to purchase that thing, they will think of you. And they will come to you and they'll more than likely purchase from you. All right. Why is retention so important? This graph actually explains this. Uh, this is a company called uh, uh, Quetra. They analyze hundreds of millions, or like more than 100 million Android phones. I don't know exactly how they do it. I guess they're installed on them. And they analyze application usage active usage, and they plot the retention curves of these different applications. And this doesn't include the applications that come pre-installed on the, on the app, it's everything else. Wow, I'm, I'm super late on the, uh, I'll rise through this. So you can see that retention of the top apps is so much better than the ones of, on the, the below, and it's no coincidence. It goes hand in hand with the success of the app. On average, retention is below 4% for the average app, and I assure you most apps are far below that. For software as a service uh, um, pro products, uh, it's the opposite. It's not retention you're measuring, it's churn, which is kind of 100 minus retention. Because in these products, usually once you convert a customer, they tend to stay on. And then it's a question, because they, they purchase uh, the, the subscription, they build this into their lifestyle or their workflow, but then some people churn off. And churn is the most important factor in all of the modeling you do for, uh, for software as a service. So just FYI. If you're asking yourself, what is the right uh, retention for me? I don't think there's an easy answer for this. I found this on a book, but this is retention for different verticals and frequency of, of use. But I think it's kind of hand wavy. I'm not sure it's really uh, something you can rely on too heavily. How do you grow retention? This is the real question. And many of the clients I work with, actually, that's the reason I'm working with them, because they want to, to build retention. I talked about delivering value. I have a, a whole other talk that is going to be about this. And basically, I'm building a workshop that is kind of, you're getting a very compressed version, very lightweight, but uh, kind of a full day on product market fit, growth, and uh, retention. So. We will delve into these things in much more detail. But delivering value, by far the most important thing. Then there's showing the value. Remember the magic moment? It's all about showing people that they actually can find this tremendous value on Facebook. And for these people, it's finding their friends. But for you, it might be something else. So onboarding, I have a slide on this. Then there's two things that are kind of iffy and are very hard to do right. One is something everyone does, which is sending notifications, emails, and SMS. It helps, definitely helps, but it's not really where you're going to drive most of your retention. It helps on the margins. And I have a slide coming on how to do this. And then there's something about forming habits, kind of hooking the users, using all sorts of behavioral psychology, giving them variable rewards, sending them to core loops. Games do this a lot and very successfully, but it's my interpretation of this, it's, it's much easier to look at a successful company and explain how they use these mechanics 
in hindsight than actually to predict, to come up and say, now we're going to do this, now we're going to give users variable reward or exploit some sort of psychological mechanism in people's minds and drive retention or growth out of that. And the reason is people are very complicated or complex. They're not just rats in a lab where you can zap them from this side and they will run to that side. So a lot of, of these ideas of how to use behavioral uh, psychology don't really pan out. It's a source of ideas, but I wouldn't rely on this to actually drive most of your growth. All right, some tactics, and I will make time for your questions as well. So onboarding. A lot of people think that this is the crux of product uh, growth, uh, and a lot of people do this wrong. So they think, OK, I activated this user, now they're mine, and I'm going to give them some information that will really make them stick to my product. One of my favorites is educating the users. Have you ever heard of this? We need to educate the users. Usually what happens, if you do a user study and you interview users about the usability of the products, you bring in new users, never used it, you realize they don't get it. They're like, ah, it's like this, or it's not... I don't get what this does, I can do something else. And you're sitting there, it's like, oh, they don't get it, this is awesome. We came up with something awesome and they just don't get it. And then you think if there was someone sitting next to them and explaining to them, it will, it will work. But you cannot, it doesn't scale very well uh, to send a person for every install of your app. So instead, you invent a workflow that is just teaching them. You know, you can do this, you can do that. And the cardinal flow here, sometimes you can do this, but not often, is that that's not the way people think. When they install your app or they visit your site for the first time, their line of thought is this. I don't know if this is worth my time. I'm giving this 40 seconds, maybe two minutes max, to figure it out. I'm a smart person. I used a lot of apps. I used a lot of websites in the past. I can figure it out. And if I can't figure it out, this site is dumb. It's their fault, goodbye, I'm never coming again. <laughs> so they're coming in, they want to try. They just want to start playing with the thing. But then there's a thing in the middle, this slideshow that wants to tell them how wonderful it is with graphics. And the, the team worked for months thinking about this design workflow uh, onboarding. And it's just in the way. They're like, get out of the way. If there's an X, they press the X. Really, this is based on my experience because I've done this mistake several times. Uh, welcome to Gmail. I don't know if you ever got one of these. I did some of those. It doesn't work. Um, even worse is you promote the product. You start telling them, you know, this is awesome because, or you're giving them some marketing bullshit that the marketing wants to tell them just as they come into the product, don't do this. Uh, asking them to do stuff for you. You know one of these persons you just met, you don't even know them, they just approach you or you... You talk with them by mistake, and then they start asking for stuff before you know them. It's like this. You cannot do this. They, don't, they just don't want to give you personal information before they realize there's a relationship going on here. It's like dating or like forming a relationship with a person. So don't ask them to subscribe, to convert, to pay you just in the onboarding. What you do want to do is um, to kind of show them the value, if you can. And games do this very well, by the way. Uh, a lot of games let you start playing immediately. And through the first levels, you learn the mechanics. And sometimes you learn some things only in level 10. Sometimes it's, there's advanced things they teach you in level 30. But they teach you. They, they create certain levels in the game, actually, that are educational. But they don't make it as if this is really a course. It's just fun. So people immediately start playing, immediately enjoy, immediately have a good time. And in the process, they're also acquiring some skill. And that definitely is the reason for them to come back. Uh, this is Duolingo. The first thing they do, one of the early things they do on the onboarding is actually showing you how you can translate or uh, start using their, their interface uh, with this cat that has this kind of, uh, it's a robotic cat, I guess. It's kind of educating you a bit, but in a very kind of, hands-on manner, where you're actually using the product. On the top is an example that Google tried to do with, where people were just onboarding, opening a Google account. Google was trying to promote Google Plus to, uh, to, to get the user active on Google Plus. They don't do this anymore. 
Okay, uh, notifications, emails, etc. I know something about this on the receiver end because I was on Gmail and I was um, one of the kind of creators of the tabs, if you know. So we put some stuff in promotion, some stuff in update. What's the difference between an update and a promotion? Promotion is largely self-serving for the sender. They're trying to promote something that helps them. Update is actually something that the user wants to receive. That was kind of our uh, thinking about this. So you can see three emails that I pulled from my own inbox. The left one, Quora, did something interesting. They said, you don't actually have to log into Quora every time, open the app to see what's going on. We're going to create a summary for you, a dashboard of the most in, in, important stuff. And you can just read it from the interface you're using anyway. And if you want to dive in a bit more, this will take you into the product. And I like that, I use it. Same with uh, LinkedIn. Do you ever get this message, people are looking at your profile in LinkedIn? Do you ever click on it? Yes. <laughs> Because in the mind of the user, this is part of the product. The product extends itself through mails, through notifications, to help you even when you're not using the application. This is a really good use of triggers. And the, the middle is kind of a middle ground. It's a win-back email. This company, which I'm sure is very good, is trying to find a reason to reactivate you, to do a win-back, what you call. So they invented this statistic about your weekly writing, writing updates, as if like, you need to know how much you wrote this week. Maybe some people find value in this, I don't. But it's actually kind of veiling the, the, the fact that they want me to re-engage with them after I stopped. And the right hand side is a promotion. This one, it's not hiding, it's, it's actually saying it's a promotion. But a lot of the stuff we're sending that's supposed to be an update is actually a promotion. And I suggest stopping this. Baking this into the life cycle of the user, really sending the right thing at the right time, is very important. Thinking of this as part of your product rather than an extension of pulling people into the product is really what you want to do. Um, OK, referrals, very important for viral growth. It's not really a, a tip, but it's another one of these mechanical things. So this also was developed in Facebook, but it's based on uh, Napster. Because as you know, Sean Parker, the creator of Napster, joined Facebook. And he taught them something about viral infection. He said, when people send each other something, whether it's an email or invitation, whatever, there's three factors that come into it. One he called the payload. The payload, it's, it's, it's a strange name, but it's actually how many people are they infecting at the same time. So um, they're sending this at the same time when they're doing this. Second is how often they, they share with them. And then what's the conversion rate? The people who receive it, how likely are they to convert? So here's an example, the quintessential example, Hotmail. Uh, some of you are too young to remember this, but Hotmail was back in the day, if you wanted mail, you needed to go to your ISP. And they gave you a really shitty mail account that was limited, etc. And people didn't like this. And then this company, Hotmail, came up with a webmail, the first kind of one of the early webmails. It was completely disconnected from my ISP, and it was really cool, and people loved it. But they had no, no budget for marketing. So they did this uh, very viral marketing. So at the bottom of each message, there was just this very simple message that said, um, you can get your own free email account. And that drove this tremendous growth over a course of less than a year, 12 million users. At the time, that was ground shattering. And eventually, the purchase of Hotmail by uh, Microsoft for 400 million, which was also a very big sum back then, still a big sum today. And it created Hotmail, which is now, I don't know what it's called even, uh, but it's still Hotmail for most people. <laughs> Uh, so that's an example. PayPal used to give people $10 to share with other people. It created a huge deficit for PayPal, but it created a huge viral infection because who will not claim the $10 in PayPal that someone sent them? And, and stuff like that. So think about these three components, and, um, and, and you can see how that worked for you. All right. So just to summarize, you need to focus on one metric that matters. Choose it well. But you cannot just optimize the one metric. It's too big. It's too vague. Find the proxy metrics and find the, the levers you can push in order to do this. 
then you need to understand which of these growth engines is working for you the most. You, usually you cannot activate all three of them until you're a really large company. So one of them is going to be the most important. And then it's a lot of optimizations. It's a lot of trial and error, A-B tests, uh, product changes, etc. cetera. Um, but the most important thing is value. The thing that will grow your product most is value and your ability to demonstrate value to these users. 